So I hope you have the Lenten beverage of your choice as we settle in for, uh, for this evening's presentation by our special guest, Dr. Margarita Mooney. She is currently an associate professor at Princeton Theological Seminary and the founder and executive director of Scala Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to classical liberal arts education. She holds a BA from Yale and an MA and PhD from Princeton and has previously served on the faculties of UNC Chapel Hill and Yale University. Her scholarly work lies at the intersection of the social sciences with philosophy and theology and she's a popular speaker and writer on these and other subjects related to culture, education, and faith. Dr. Mooney's remarks this evening on the topic of virtue ethics will round out, as Jennifer has already mentioned, the first half of the Leonine year. As you know, the first half of your Leonine fellowship concentrates on the theological and philosophical foundation of a Catholic worldview. Before we turn to the practical application of the social teaching of the church, which will start next month, let's savor this opportunity tonight to ponder human happiness and the freedom that is found in a life of virtue. To lead us in these considerations, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Margarita Mooney. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Margarita. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here with you tonight. And I wanted to, focus my talk tonight on three things. I will go over some basic points of Catholic moral theology, and I'll connect this topic to why I think this is so important, not only for your own knowledge and your vocations, but as a way of being a witness to a world that is enveloped in a lot of fear and darkness right now. And I'm going to do this in the following manner. I will share with you a little bit of my own journey as a student of psychology and sociology and how I've always been interested in this topic of resilience, how people overcome adversity. My work has taken me to battlefields in Central America, to the living rooms of political dissidents in Cuba, to rural areas in Haiti, and most recently, I did an interview project with young adults in the United States who had experienced some forms of trauma. And it was precisely those projects that led me to study the Catholic tradition of moral philosophy and theology in order to better do the kind of social science I cared about. Because I kept seeing that people are seeking happiness and fulfillment, but sometimes lack clear guidelines to differentiate happiness from mere pleasure or they're groping for a way to find joy, even while undergoing suffering, which can't always be cured. So a lot of my work focuses on the importance of returning to the study of metaphysics, the study of being, why we even exist to begin with, what are the goods we're created for, and how that can help people to find strength in the face of injustice and suffering, and ultimately find hope to go on. I'll share with you some insights on these questions from Pope Leo, from Servius Pinkers, great moral theologians and leaders. Um, and also I'll link that to the work of Craig Stephen Titus on virtues and resilience. Titus was a PhD student of Servius Pinkers and he's dedicated his work to continuing this line of moral theology in the Thomistic tradition and connecting it productively to the fields of psychology and counseling, helping to establish programs in moral theology and psychology at Divine Mercy University. And I'm gonna conclude by sharing some examples from a young man who I knew that lived the, vir the virtues heroically known to some of you, John Artunian. Um, who exemplified how fortitude and hope and eternal life can sharpen each other. As I do this lecture, I wanna encourage you to be thinking about three things. One thing I want you to be thinking about is how does this understanding of the connection between the moral life and happiness that I'm gonna discuss, how does this differ from what you may have learned elsewhere about what happiness is or what morality is? I also want you to be thinking about, as I describe the cardinal virtues of prudence and temperance, fortitude and justice, as well as the theological virtues of faith, hope and charity, I want you to be asking yourself, 
What is one virtue you feel called to grow in right now? And are there ways that you have experienced that the cardinal virtues and the theological virtues reinforce each other? Also, I want you to be thinking about how to apply these insights in this strange times during the COVID pandemic when our normal routines and relationships have been interrupted. What are some ways that you could intentionally reach out to other people who need virtuous friendship right now? Before I begin with an overview of some principles from Catholic moral theology, I want to tell you a little bit about the project I was working on that led me to really want to study moral theology and philosophy more. I did an interview-based project where I first analyzed survey results of young adults who had been in a national study for more than 10 years. And I picked those who said they had experienced some form of trauma and I went out and did interviews with them. And I was really interested in the forms of meaning that people form in the face of adversity, how they find social support, and how experiencing adversity affects their faith in God. And let me tell you about one person who I met. He was actually the first person I interviewed. His name was Alex. He was an African-American who lived in the South. He was about 26 years old. And as soon as we sat down to talk, he told me he had been a hell raiser who lived a negative lifestyle, as he put it, for about 10 years of alcohol and drug abuse. He had been picked up by the police for theft and for vandalism. He struggled with ADHD. He had been diagnosed bipolar and he had bouts of extreme anger that would lead him to lose control, even threatening one time to kill his brother with a knife. Alex's mother grew so frustrated with him that she told him, she wished he was dead. He went and got a gun and went into the kitchen and put a gun to his head. And his mother told him, please go ahead and do it. I'll throw a party and bring some cake. Alex put the gun down, but has never forgotten how horrible that felt. But his real turning point was actually at a party when a friend of his tried heroin for the first time and died in his arms. Alex had hit rock bottom. But the worst part of hitting rock bottom, he told me, was not only the effects of what 10 years of drug abuse did to his body, but that he had what he called a soul ache. He couldn't really desire anything anymore. He just wanted to think about nothing, not care about anything. He said his soul was just dead. The only thing that got him out of this soul ache was returning to the Baptist church of his childhood. And what he said about returning to church, I thought was so interesting because he said that while he was in his partying lifestyle, he had a lot of fun and he thought he was happy, but that happiness only lasted for a few hours and then he would either get into a fight or end up really hung over. And he thought, you know, there's more to life than just spending a couple hundred dollars on something that might make you feel good or it might kill you. And he decided he really wanted to find a kind of happiness that was going to last. And when he went back to church, he felt that he was happy when he left. He was happy while he was, while he was there. And he was happy that he went. Now, this may sound like an extreme example, someone who's been abusing drugs and alcohol for, for 10 years. But what I thought was so interesting about Alex, who had been through the criminal justice system, who had been through the mental health system, he was asking questions that those systems are not designed to answer. He was asking basic questions that all of us face in different degrees and in different ways. Why do I exist when I have problems that I may never overcome? Can we learn from our mistakes and even grow from them morally? And is there a lasting source of happiness that's distinct from a pleasure that wears off? To think about these perennial human questions, we can turn to thinkers like Servius Pinkers, who in his work as a moral theologian, was trying to overcome the divorce between moral theology and the topic of happiness. 
and wanted to connect a Christian understanding of moral theology is grounded in freedom and a robust concept of the good, not just freedom of choice or freedom of indifference, freedom of indifference, but instead freedom for excellence. And so what he says is that the key to this renewal of moral theology is to rediscover our spiritual nature in its spontaneous yearning for truth, goodness, and happiness. And I think that quote is so important because Alex and the other young adults that I interviewed and the students that I work with and the people I meet from all kinds of backgrounds, even if they've experienced trauma, sometimes caused by their own self-destructive behaviors or sometimes caused by injustices that have occurred to them, they are longing for truth and goodness and happiness. And even though Alex had this soul ache that was weighing on him and he felt like his desires were being squashed, there was a part of him that could still connect to this, to this desire for truth and goodness and happiness. So Pink Airs goes on to describe that, well, you know, how did we end up losing this sight, losing sight of this question of happiness? Well, on the one hand, William of Ockham wanted to get rid of our, of the ideas the human person is even having a natural inclination to the good. And he replaced that with this idea that our basic nature is to make choices itself, leading to this freedom of indifference. Immanuel Kant was concerned that our desires for happiness are really just egotistical self-interest and hedonistic. So he defined the good life as really an ethics of following obligations, duties. One way or another, what we ended up with was a kind of utilitarianism. What's good for us is what's chosen freely or what gives us pleasure. And it was precisely this, this narrow understanding of human freedom that kept stumping me in my work. Because it was very clear when you talk to people like Alex that they're making moral judgments about right and wrong, good and bad, even if in their own lives, they're not living up to it. There is a sense that there is an absolute truth and a moral right and wrong that goes beyond pleasure or simply being able to choose what one feels like in a moment. So what Pink Airs is trying to do is connect the choices or feelings we have back to moral goods in the spiritual life. So what I found in reading Catholic moral theology that I found was missing implicitly in the philosophy underlying so much of the social sciences I studied was what Pope Leo tells us about in his essay on human liberty, that human beings are indeed creatures with instincts, but we also have reason. And also this idea that Human beings are wounded and sinful, but we don't need to be a fatalist about that because as Christians, we believe that we can grow and heal and improve. And part of that growth and improvement is growing and knowing what the good is so we can freely choose it. And finally, you know, Pope Leo also talks about we can't divorce human reason from divine law. Human reason is not the supreme principle and the source or judge of truth. And again, you know, this is coming from Catholic tradition and I've only given you one example, but I could tell you of many more examples of people that I've spoken to from a variety of backgrounds who in layperson's terms affirm again and again that there's a kind of transcendent truth that goes beyond their personal truth or their choices. And I find also that pink hairs Going back to him for a moment, you know, he, he hits on one of the central problems that I kept encountering in my work um, and my training in sociology and psychology that somehow, because we focused what's good on pleasureful, then what about pain? Pain becomes the opposite of pleasure, the opposite of good. Whereas pink airs points us to a deeper tradition in moral theology where, where actually joy can be born of trials and of pains endured. That there's a kind of joy that comes from accepting suffering with courage and love. Pleasure is brief and variable and superficial, Pinker says, but joy is lasting. Like the, ex like the excellence and like the virtues that engender it. Joy is communicable and it grows by being shared. 
And it was this joy that someone like Alex was looking for and distinguishing from the pleasure that he once had in his hell-raising party lifestyle. Now, turning further to the Catholic tradition, as explained in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, talking about the virtues, you know, what is this term virtue? Well, a virtue is an habitual and firm disposition to do the good. The virtuous person tends toward the good and chooses it in concrete actions. So in other words, human virtues are firm attitudes, stable dispositions, habitual perfections of intellect and will that govern our actions, order our passions, and guide our conduct according to reason and faith. The virtues make make it possible for ease and self-mastery and joy in leading a morally good life. The moral virtues are acquired by human effort and they are the fruit and the seed of morally good acts. Then the tradition of the Catholic Church as explained in the Catechism goes on to talk about four cardinal or, or, or central human virtues of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Prudence is the virtue that disposes practical reason to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. Prudence is like the measure or the rule of our inner conscience. It, it helps us apply moral principles to concrete cases. Justice is the moral virtue that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. We have justice towards God and justice towards our neighbor. Fortitude is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good. And interestingly, in his work on the virtues, the psychologist Martin Seligman has found that this virtue, fortitude, courage, is present in every major wisdom tradition and um, uh, religious tradition. Fortitude, sometimes courage. It's, it's present across traditions. These are human virtues that are recognized by all major wisdom traditions and religions. Fortitude is important to help us conquer fear, even fear of death and face trials and persecutions. With fortitude, we can even have the courage to renounce and sacrifice our very lives in defense of a just cause. Finally, the fourth cardinal virtue is temperance, the moral virtue that moderates the attraction of pleasures and provide balance and provides balance in the use of created goods. Temperance helps us acquire mastery over our instincts and keeps our desires within the limits of what's honorable. Now, as I mentioned, these, these human virtues can sometimes be found under different words in different traditions, but the Catholic Church also talks about the theological virtues, those virtues that help shape our human faculties for participation in the divine life and community with the Trinity. Those virtues, faith, hope, and charity. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God and believe all that he has said and revealed to us and that the Holy Church proposes for our belief. Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness. Placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying not on our own strength. Let me pause here for a second because I think that this point about hope as a theological virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying not on our own strength helps correct what I see as an often as a, as a limitation of the psychological sciences when taken by themselves. Because sometimes the psychological sciences when taken by themselves seem to call on people to find somehow infinite strength within themselves. And believe me, nobody who I've interviewed or known well thinks that inside of themselves they have infinite strength. So although a lot can be learned from the social sciences about how to grow in human virtue by themselves, I don't think the field of psychology or sociology can tell us what to do when we confront our own weaknesses. 
but this virtue of, or if we confront unjust situations or frankly confront our own death. But this theological virtue of hope directs our desires to desire the kingdom of heaven because our complete happiness is in eternal life. So hope is really key because it helps us purify our desires and order them to the kingdom of God. And hope helps sustain us during times of desolation and can open up our heart and expectation of eternal beatitude. Remember the beatitudes, blessed are those who suffer for they shall be comforted. Hope allows us to experience joy in the midst of trials. Hope is a weapon that protects us in the strength of salvation. Finally, the third theological virtue is charity. The theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and love our neighbor as ourselves for the love of God. Again, recalling the scriptures from Paul, charity is patient and kind. Charity is not boastful or rude. Charity does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Charity bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The theological virtue of charity, I think is also extremely important to correct another limitation of some versions of psychology that essentially help people to see themselves as victims and teach people the ways in which the actions of others have harmed them and the ways that they need to, to correct or call people out for their failings. But again, if you bring in the Catholic moral theology and virtue ethics, and we acknowledge that all of us have shortcomings and all of us have failings. And even if we're hurt by people close to us or people that work with us, Catholic moral theology, this understanding of charity as a theological virtue, this understanding that we can participate in the divine nature helps us to soften out some of our natural inclinations to want to have absolute perfection with the people around us and to be able to forgive people who have harmed us and find patience even in the face of wrongdoing. So it's extremely interesting that as the field of psychology has returned in some in some ways to want to talk about things like forgiveness and mercy it has almost had to go back to this tradition of moral theology and virtue ethics to ground that and there's many different trends within psychology i've mentioned a few of them i mean sometimes you get the sense that we're meant to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps other times you get the sense that we're passive victims of injustice all the time but then there's also a rebirth in psychology of actually wanting to engage with these questions of moral theology so that we can talk about things like forgiveness and mercy and patience. So the work of Craig Titus the reason I think it's so important is that he's trying to take what's good from psychosocial research and link it back to older Thomistic discussions of virtue, especially fortitude. And like Titus, I'm really interested in creating a dialogue, a two-way dialogue where modern empirical sciences can help describe the pathways through which we develop virtues, including virtues of growing from adversity while also addressing the moral questions that come to people and being able to ask the questions about God's presence in the midst of our human struggles and how God supports our efforts. Moral theology is a reflection on scripture and tradition, but it's also an understanding of God's action in the world and in people's lives. And the social sciences should be able to help with this by demonstrating cognitive pathways, affective motivations and interpersonal relationships that support the development of the virtues. 
And so I want to say a little bit about why this moral tradition of virtue ethics is so important today for the social sciences and ultimately, I think, for your lives and for how you interact with other people during this time of a lot of fear. So first of all, Titus explained that, you know, virtue ethics matters because we want to look for positive growth as a result of stressful life experiences. And we can learn from studies on resilience, how to grow in love and patience and forgiveness and fortitude as a result of the of uh, traumatic experiences we may experience. But in addition, Titus talks about something he calls integrity resilience. And I think this concept is extremely important because when suffering or when going through hardship, people need to retain a sense of personal coherence and a sense of, of being able to have a unity in their identity when they're feeling disintegrated because of physical injury, mental distortions, or damage to, to social bonds or other capacities. So for example, going back to the to this anecdote about Alex that I shared, the trauma and the that, that he had experienced went beyond simply the biomedical or the physical or the psychological and it affected his very sense of his own identity and his sense of personal integrity. Titus also talks about how the theological virtues could help us keep our patience when suffering from incomprehension and disrespect of others. When seen in the light of the suffering of Christ, our sacrifice and our suffering can take on a new meaning and help us conform to the truth and live by our conscience, even when misunderstood by others. And this, this, this patience, this, this forbearance even, I think is extremely important given the emphasis in some versions of psychology to help us see ourselves as people who are fundamentally victims of injustice and passive in the face of suffering. But to live these virtues, we need the gifts of the spirit, including humility about our own failings. We need to be willing to sacrifice ourselves. And we need to ultimately be willing to embrace even forms of suffering that we didn't choose and have fortitude in the middle of difficulties and delay self-gratification in order to serve others. Aquinas's approach to virtue, this kind of transcendent resilience is advanced by the free imitation of Christ in love of God the Father and in seeking the good of others through charity love with the help of the spirit. So with the cardinal virtues and the theological virtues, we can experience resilience, coping with hardship, maintaining our integrity and growing and healing and flourishing. And I think that this message of hope in the face of suffering and fortitude in the face of challenges is extremely important today. In the last year, given the shutdown, the physical suffering people have undergone, the economic displacement, the breakdown of relationships, the conversations that I'm having with people, people need fortitude, but they also need the supernatural virtue of hope. They need to believe in eternal life in order to believe that God is going to help them and give them strength and compliment and work with them through, the, through their natural virtues to strengthen them and endure through hardship. This virtue of fortitude is related to endurance and to taking risks. Um, and I wanna just close with a story that I will share with you about a person who, as I mentioned, lived these virtues, I think, to an heroic degree. Someone known to many of you, or just some of you, John Artunian. In the last year of his life, I was blessed to have many conversations with John. And the reflection that I wanted to share with you was how John faced his diagnosis with both the human virtue of fortitude and also with the supernatural virtue of hope. And one of the things that, that Titus is trying to show and pink airs and all of the readings that we we're discussing tonight 
that's how the supernatural virtues, the theological virtues and the human virtues strengthen each other. When John was first given his cancer diagnosis, I expected him to recover. Um, and of course he needed, um, of course he needed the human virtues of fortitude, but we weren't really thinking in terms of eternal life. We were just thinking that he was gonna have a tough battle with cancer and recover and go on being a fellow of the Leonian Forum and a student at Columbia and recover from this. But after about a year, he was given a diagnosis that there was no medical treatment left for his cancer and he was expected to die within a year to five years. And I was truly astounded uh, when we met in New York and discussed that John had a sense of peace about the end of his earthly life and he accepted that if God had given him a vocation to sacrifice, to lay down his life, that even if he didn't understand why, he would accept that cause. As his illness progressed, John needed to grow in the virtues of, virtue, of fortitude and hope because he became very sick and he suffered a lot physically. And in some of our later conversations, John admitted that he was afraid, he was facing fear. When it became clear that he was not going to, not only that he was not going to recover in the long term, but that death was approaching, I met with him in the hospital. And after we lamented and cried, we talked about eternal life. And at this point, it, this was real. This is what he was looking at um, in the relatively near future. And what I told John that day was to remember all of the discussions that we had had when things were calmer and before his disease had progressed. That in the end, our ultimate beatitude and our ultimate happiness is in communion with God. And if he was going to reach that a lot sooner than any of us had ever anticipated, that I hoped that he would endure his sufferings that had been given to him, endure them with fortitude and with joy. And what I saw in John in the final few weeks of his life and what his mother has shared with me and also his father, um, that John embraced his cross and I actually saw this, this transformation in him that he was experiencing joy and beatitude in the midst of his suffering. And at, at the time this was happening, it was difficult to put into words because I was afraid. I didn't want John to die. I was afraid of what was coming. And I at times doubted my own faith. I just couldn't understand why God would allow such a thing to happen. And I needed help to, be, to keep up my own fortitude and my own hope. But after John died, I had a meeting, I met for dinner with his parents and they had just come back from um, a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Because, and this is, I think the lesson that I wanna share with you. Again, John dying young at the age of 26 is an unusual event, but I think there was a lesson in that for me and a lesson for us to learn, which is precisely that this human virtue of fortitude and the supernatural virtue of hope in the face of suffering are a tremendous witness in a world that is engulfed in the fear of darkness. There are a lot of people out there who for one reason or another are facing some kind of darkness, some kind of existential crisis, some kind of loneliness, some kind of anomie, some kind of alienation and don't know where to turn. And John inspired me to be able to face the darkness with even greater joy than I, than I had before. And he also influenced his parents. Um, John's father had a very deep experience of God during his trip to Jerusalem and was taken home to God a few months later because of COVID. I've since met with John's mother many times and we've had discussions. She even told me that as John grew nearer to the end of his life, that he was already looking towards that eternal life and in some ways was no longer even attached to this world. And the witness of that, the witness of having human fortitude 
And supernatural hope in the midst of suffering is something that I wanna challenge each and every one of you to think about how you can do that in your own environments. In the past week, I gave another, I was a moderator on a panel about suicide. You know, what else do you do on Valentine's Day? Then meet in New York with a psychiatrist, a comedian, and an existentialist philosopher to talk about suicide to thousands of people watching us on YouTube. I'm a YouTuber, as my six-year-old niece says it. Well, you wouldn't believe the kinds of conversations I've had by telling people I spent Valentine's Day with an existentialist philosopher, a psychiatrist, and a comedian talking about suicide. People want to talk about darkness. I said this the following day, still trying to figure out what had happened, but I shared it with a woman who is my massage therapist. I had a car accident five years ago and I have chronic neck pain. And I mentioned this to her. She said, can I see the YouTube? And I said, sure, I'll send it to you. And then she tells me her boyfriend has thought a lot about suicide. The reason being that maybe not unlike Alex, he lived a hell raising life as a teenager. He dealt drugs and he made a lot of money dealing drugs. And some people showed up at his house with a gun to steal the money. When his mother tried to stop them, they shot his mother in the head in front of her children. And this woman's boyfriend has never forgiven himself and has thought about suicide ever since that day. And I simply said to her, we need to have hope in eternal life, that God is good and somehow he can make that right even though it was a horrible thing to happen. And she said to me, you know what? I do have faith in God. And I do believe the dead are still with us because I had an abortion 30 years ago and I have thought about it every single day since then. I've never been able to have children and I've had pain in my pelvis ever since that day. But you know, one day I fell asleep on my couch and when I woke up, someone was in the room was a young man and she said, he looked like my boyfriend that I had when I had the abortion. And it later dawned on me that that was my son. And I said to her, thank you for sharing. Um, and she said, you know, I've just learned as I've gotten older, it's better to talk about the darkness and to let it out but I do have faith and I believe in a good God. So what I'm telling you is that to summarize this, this Catholic moral tradition is not only something for Catholics. It's a way of thinking through these perennial human questions that I started us off with. You know, why do I exist at all? Can we learn from our mistakes and even grow from them? And is there a lasting source of happiness that's distinct from pleasure? And what I've tried to share with you is how the human virtues of fortitude, firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good can be sharpened by this theological virtue of hope where we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness. That kind of hope you cannot get in a pill and you cannot get it from therapy. People are looking for a kind of hope that is bigger than they than what anything can get in this than they anything they can get in this world. Bigger than any kind of momentary pleasure. And people are looking for a meaning to their existence that helps them have this kind of integrity resilience, even when they're coping with tremendous difficulties. And so what I also, you know, tried to share with you by, by giving that example of John is that when living these virtues and growing in them, the fruit of these virtues, as we know from Galatians 5, the fruit of these of of charity and the fruit of living the virtues is a life of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
And right now, I think that living a life of virtues, having the knowledge of what those virtues are, but being a witness whose life exemplifies the fruits of the spirit, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, is going to put you into a position to lead other people to grow in these virtues through your friendship with them and through your love for them and your prayer for them. So I wanna remind you of the questions that I started us off with to think about how this understanding of morality as, as intrinsically related to our happiness, freedom for excellence contrasts with an understanding of happiness that's simply about choice or pleasure and how this understanding of morality and happiness and freedom for excellence can help make sense of how suffering and pain can help us to grow in the virtues, not just take away from us. And think about your own life. What are the virtues that you need to grow in? And how can the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity strengthen the human virtues of prudence, temperance, fortitude, and justice, as well as vice versa? And please, Think about ways that you can intentionally reach other people who need virtuous friendship. A lot of people have told me that in the time of COVID, the social isolation has been kind of good for them because sometimes not having to interact with a lot of people makes life easier. But this is my challenge to you. Think about ways you can be a witness to this world that's enveloped in fear and darkness and share this message of hope and happiness that comes from Catholic moral theology, as well as from a lot of the social sciences that are recovering this deeper moral tradition to help give people guideposts towards freedom for excellence, even in this life when we are wounded and broken with the certainty that we are created in love and destined for eternal life. Thank you. <laughs>